Thank you very much, and welcome to B-Sides London. Welcome to my talk, Think About the Box. Um, so many people tell us to think outside the box, and I thought it would be interesting to think about the box itself and what the box is. In short, how are we thinking about stuff, and how could we change that to our advantage? Before I actually start, I'd like to ask a question to the audience to ponder while I'm talking. What would you do if there was a highly configurable, very hackable system just within your reach, and once hacked, you could make way better decisions, and you would have a lot more to think about, and you would have a lot more options. And no worries, all the other questions I'm going to ask during the talk, um, I'm going to answer myself, like, why exactly this topic? Now, within our industry, I think that behavioral patterns, knee-jerk reactions, and ego are actually more damaging than the next zero day or the next dump uh, by the shadow brokers or malware in general. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about that. And some of you will have maybe seen that slide, uh, your brain is lying to you. And when I say your brain is lying to you, I'm hugely over-exaggerating. What I mean is, your brain is not telling you all of the truth all of the time. The reason for that is very simple. Uh, all our senses can pick up way more information than our brains can handle, so bandwidth is limited. Or you could put it that way, reality is just DDoSing our brains. And the interesting question is, what comes through? What makes it through to our conscious mind? So Dr. Leonard Orr in the 70s had this theory that whatever the thinker thinks, the prover proves. He has seen the brain as having two distinct halves, not the biological ones, but um, one part of the brain that thinks about stuff and the other that tries to prove stuff. So the thinker can think about really anything. Thinker can think itself sick, can think itself well, can think we're living on a spherical planet, a flat Earth inside a hollow planet, that this planet is circling around the sun, that the sun is circling around the planet. It literally can think about anything. And the prover's job is so much simpler, it just tries to prove what the thinker thinks. The problem with that is that we are getting very fixed in our thinking positions because we constantly get reaffirmed, right? All the stuff that makes it into our conscious mind seems to reaffirm what we already know. So imagine this scene, uh, just to demonstrate it. If you were an ignorant Westerner like myself and needed to go to the loo very badly, then in this scene probably your brain would send a strong visual signal of that sign saying tourists and souvenirs. Or maybe if there was a restaurant nearby, that could be somewhere where I could pick up, um, uh, where I could go to the loo as well. If I was hungry, my nose would pick up more smells, or it would seem like that because that's the data that gets forwarded. So even the suspicious looking sausages from the vendor uh, at the corner might look tasty at that moment. And there's something that always takes precedence, and that is if we perceive danger. This is a very deep biological imprint. So whenever we think there's something threatening us, everything else we are just thinking about at the moment goes to the background. So we could say that brains are filters with dynamic rules, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, our brains are chuckling between what our body needs at the moment, what we're thinking about at the moment, and everything else. So it's really cool. The only thing is, if I want to know why I reacted to a certain situation in a certain way and do something about that, I would love to have an audit trail. So it might be um, something like Splunk for the brain, but we don't have that yet. Uh, could be a good thing. I don't know. But on the other hand, we also don't lo have log files or anything for that um, fictitious Splunk. So the question is, how do we get to the point where we actually can see why we reacted in a way um, that really doesn't fit us or why we thought certain things? And the answer to that is you have to observe yourself at all times. So if you are hacking stuff, uh, you would do a black box approach. You would just try to figure out what you're doing at the moment and just observe it, observe your reactions, analyze them maybe, but don't judge them. And that is the only way where you can get a feeling for uh, that dynamic firewall and whatever it did at that moment. But 
you are observing yourself, using yourself as a tool in order to change yourself. So there's a lot of recursion involved. And a pro tip, um, don't dive into madness. That makes it worse. And so the next thing, of course, is now that we know that we want to change things or that we just want to broaden our thinking, how do we do it? We need to disable a few of our defenses. And defend, um, disabling defenses is not as easy as we might think. So there's only a few people in the room, but I'd like to keep an open, you and to keep an open mind, that you keep an open mind, actually, because I'm going to show you a picture of a guy with a giant cock. Uh, and judging by your reaction, this is not really what your brain prepared you for at that moment. But if I said something like Darth Vader, you wouldn't expect that. Although your mind and your preconceptions were preparing you for nudity just a slide ago, you probably didn't think about that Darth Vader from another sexy universe. So there's a lot of defense going on and a lot of stuff going on which enables us to actually act quickly when something happens. And I'd like to take an excursion into cybersecurity defense mechanisms and how modern cybersecurity tends to work. And this slide is just, we've got some programs, packets, whatever you name, the blue guys in the left-hand corner. And they are hitting some kind of anti-DDoS solution that we have in order that our services are not brought down and only that um, more or less legitimate packets make it in. Then we have some optimized reaction like an IDS antivirus that's looking for specific patterns, reacts to those. We might have some kind of anomaly engine running that just looks for anything suspicious in user behavior or something that hasn't been seen before. There will be sandboxes where we test out programs and run them in order to see what kind of DLLs they want to run and what the outcome should be. There are firewalls everywhere and at least a few packets or programs make it to our core. I use the crown jewel as the core because I thought maybe a few of you wanted to play bullshit bingo. Um, and of course, we as humans are fundamentally different. So I put together a different slide for, for us. Um, it looks like that. We've got new ideas and new thoughts coming in all the time and then we hit the bandwidth limit. So a lot of it gets dropped. The next thing that happens is in order to get on a fast track, our brain will form behavioral patterns. And if anything matches that, we will react more or less automatically without even thinking about it. That's quite like uh, pattern matching in, in antivirus. As humans, we are really good at spotting anomalies. So we've got that going for us. And of course, our way of uh, sandboxing stuff is daydreaming. So I could think about what would happen if I kissed her, if I punch, punched him, things like that. And it would be all within the safe space of my mind. Well, my mind is not a safe space, but you know what I mean. And after that, we have the problem that the prover only approves of the stuff that we think we already know. And only a few new thoughts and ideas make it actually to our brain. So is that a problem? Are we, are we all robots? Um, and robots meaning not the cool kind of robots that fight aliens or something, but uh, just in our behavior. The thing is, I don't think so. Uh, we are not as robotic as this slides um, might, might, in, uh, might show. I think we are just staying robots if we know that we are acting in a way that really doesn't fit us and don't want to try to change that. But it sounds like a lot of work. And of course, there's the question, why would you do it? What, how does it benefit your cybers and why put the lot of, a lot of work into observing yourself in order to get to learn about you? Is there any benefit? And yes, there is. I think so. The first benefit is you are having more options. If you were around for the first talk uh, this morning, we talked about IT and women in IT and how you can't really break into the market. Now imagine you are a recruiter and you have a certain picture in mind how somebody in your team should look like. They should have this and that certifications, 
be of a certain age, maybe, and bring this and that skill set. Now, maybe you've seen Lord of the Rings. If you've seen Lord of the Rings, you will notice that Nicolas Cage didn't play every role. But this could be your IT team if you just have that fixed position in your mind how an IT guy should look like. And let's be honest, with a lot of the rings, nobody in a sane mind, mind would have hired the hobbits in the first place. They just kind of tacked along and saved the day. So if you broaden your horizon with that, as a recruiter for example, then you will have a lot more diversity in, in your team and it will benefit you in the end, I think. And there's the whole thing about understanding yourself better. The President of the United States, um, Donald Trump, it's the new one, allegedly said last year before he was elected that he doesn't like to look too deep into his own psyche <laughs> because he just doesn't like what he sees. And my advice is, and that is a general advice, just don't be like Trump, you can't go wrong with that. And understanding yourself better is obviously something where you start maybe with a crude picture, what you think you are or what you think you are like. Um, but if you try to fill out the picture with many iterations, you will find out that it might not be true. There might be things you never know existed within yourself and it's, it's a fun thing. So um, one of the last points is you're doing things differently. If you went over to InfoSecurity and bought every box from every vendor, put it in your network, then you would do what nearly everybody else does, which is cool, which gives you protection. But in order to do things really differently, you have to be creative. And that's where not only protection comes in, but deception, detection, and new ways of thinking about how you do security. This is a picture from an inflatable tank that the US Americans used in World War II to distract the Germans to bind resources and to confuse the hell out of us, basically. And if you can bind resources with your attacker by being creative and doing uh, deception things and stuff like that, you will have an edge, you will get the advantage back. So just thinking slightly differently and thinking about thinking really gives you a freedom of choice instead of the freedom from choice. And so I think it's really worth it. I started with a question, what would you do if you had an hackable device um, that you had access to? Well, um, of course, I was referring to our brains, your brain. And I think now that you're quite aware of that, how could you not try to hack yourself? I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? So I'd like to thank my mentor, Nick Drage, and Besides London for having me. And thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you.